transcribers, if you would do me a favor and starting with ISIS, if you would say your name and then spell your name for me. Yeah, I've been doing that for 65 years now, 60 <laughs> years. <laughs> Say your name and then spell your name so that our transcribers can um, Aquarian, I-S. Electricity Aquarian. Everybody knows how to spell electricity. E-L-E-C-T-R-I-C-I-T-Y. And Aquarian is A-Q-U-A-R-I-A-N. Sure, we met in the Source family um, over 30 years ago. We were part of a communal group that uh, ran the Source restaurant in Sunset. In Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, ISIS had been there for several years, and I came in, in um, sep to stay in September of 1974. The Source family um, started out with a, uh, by a man named Jim Baker, who um, started the Source restaurant on Sunset. He was a follower of Yogi Bhajan's, and then he started his own uh, communal family in the early 70s. When and uh, we were a tribal family that uh, lived up in the Hollywood Hills and ran the Source. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> that was pretty. That was pretty noisy. Jason, can you do me a favor? Could you possibly tell them we're shooting? If there's any way they could not walk back and forth here, it would be a lot to us. Derek, is it, is it at all decent for you? Uh, it's some of the best audio I've ever done. Is it really? I thought it might be. So you're happy? Uh, no, but let's just go ahead and you know, turn on the juice and see what shakes with. So I'm sorry. I, sorry. I really like what you're saying. Could you just say the same thing? Uh, what the source was. Okay. The source uh, family actually originated uh, out of the source restaurant, which was a famous restaurant on Sunset Boulevard. Started by a man who was Jim Baker, and he was a legend in Hollywood to begin with, with his other two restaurants. Uh, it morphed into being a communal, tribal family who we ended up running the restaurant and living communally in the Hollywood Hills. The, one of the old sayings is kind of like, people were stealing food from the source, so father decided to get a house so when people, for everybody to live in, so when people stole food, they'd take it home. <laughs> so it, it kind of grew from there and uh, around uh, father began to meditate and people began to share that meditation with him. The crew at the source was kind of the core that eventually formed the, the family. And what would you say are the main uh, tenets of of the source? What was it that what was it that you were abiding by in terms of life principles? It, it changed it, uh, through the four or five years we were together. It just completely evolved and changed, and we went. We became actually a mystery school, and. Um, you know, just a kindness, allowing, but yet getting into, we believed in reincarnation, we believed in karma, and believing in reincarnation, the early part of it brought us through all lifetimes. We experienced what, it would, you know, the Indian incarnation, the Egyptian, and we went through all of that before we kind of settled into getting really um, on the crossover into what they call the Aquarian age, and then just the mystery teachings that brought you into that. And our tenets changed. I mean, we had um, Ten Commandments for the Age of Aquarius, uh, Life, Mind, Truth, Love, Do Everything, um, Maintain the Standard. Uh, we were founded on sex, drugs, rock and roll. I mean, that, that was the 70s, but one of the unique things we did was we added spirit to everything. And so if it was spiritual or a spiritual evolution, um, that was just added on to the tenants to keep evolving. We just kept evolving. We weren't ever stagnant, ever. And we drew from many different sources. We drew from Manly P. Hall from the Philosophical Research Center. 
uh, the Yogi Bhajan, uh, anything that ran a be uh, rang a bell of truth, plus we added to it. Father was continuously adding to it by um, what he was, well, for lack of a better word, channeling at the time himself, you know? Yeah, he's got to pause us for a second. I can tell he was on the move. <clears throat> Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, those weren't the tenants, but that's what. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> they just have no respect, do they? <clears throat> it's not going to give us a break. What the hell? But you know, part of part of our tenants would have just a, a, arisen. <laughs> I wouldn't even know if we would call it tenants. It's just our whole way of life was, you know, the the natural childbirths, the breastfeeding, the homeschooling. Um, you know, we made our own fabulous clothes. Our vegetarian. You know, everything that. Uh, forerunners of that time. We weren't the only ones, but we were definitely a very large part of it, of what's happening now, you know, with urban homesteading and and, and the Green Project and just all of that that's happening. Well, to so. set it up a little better, uh, Father was a really powerful human being whose father abandoned him when he was a baby. And he spent his whole life searching for that father figure. Um, through really powerful people. He was one of the most highly decorated Marines in World War II. Mm -hmm. um, went through, all, you know, he challenged the world heavyweight judo champion to a match and took him out in 17 seconds. The history is phenomenal. Uh, but when he began to dabble with spirit, he, was, he became a Vedantic monk. He was in Los Angeles by this time and he grew in spirit and ended up becoming one of Yogi Bhajan's um, you know, prime students, was just right there with him. So as his consciousness grew and his evolution grew, people were attracted to him magnetically. We were, attra we were attracted to him. We didn't have a choice. It was, we didn't choose him. We were chosen for this, not by him specifically, but just by that moment. As he grew, he changed his name. Instead of Jim Baker, he became Father. <clears throat> then he morphed into Father Yod. And eventually, when he discovered the sacred name of God, which we believe is the sacred name of God, which he channeled, we didn't have that word at the time, but we, he channeled it, uh, was Yehoah. Um, eventually, he changed his name to Yehoah. And, you know, he said basically his legacy is to live rightly, which involves all the things she's talking about, natural childbirth, healthy living, uh, spiritual growth, do everything with life, mind, truth, and love, do everything right. Um, so to live rightly, and then to die rightly. And by that we mean, <clears throat> um, you know, conscious death, not freaking out. Uh, when you meet your dweller on the threshold, which is the dweller of your own making, uh, your own fears, your own doubts, rather than freaking out and screaming, laugh in the face of the dweller and you can pass through the other side. Um, so live rightly, die rightly, and the die rightly we complete with, <clears throat> we do everything we can. The laws have made it difficult, but we're working, we're making a lot of progress on being able to keep the body for three and a half, three and a half days to lie in state. And we chant the sacred name for three and a half days, 24 hours a day around the clock. And this has been happening recently as some of our members have passed. We have people all over the country who are set up on a, a schedule and they take this hour you know, 8 o'clock in the morning Hawaii time, but they'll be in Cincinnati or wherever. So the three and a half days is the completion of dying rightly and then to do business rightly, which means to live your business, your life rightly through business. Uh, you know, do every act honestly and truthfully. Be 15 minutes early for every appointment. Do everything correct, you know. So basically it was very practical teachings, but with a spiritual twist. So... Yeah. Uh, it, you know, the tenants were very strong when you ask about the tenants, but it was also a very eclectic thing that drew from all religions, all studies, everything that uh, Jim Baker 
Father Yod and Yehoah had drawn together all in one place. He was a seeker. He had studied everything. So he brought it all together in one place. And it was, it, there was a lot of humor. Was, uh, there was, uh, things were very humorous. Like he would say money. Money is a magical green in energy. It produces anything instantly. The best yeah. tool in the world. Yeah, most people would shy away from that back in the, those days, you know. And um, he just did that twist on it and made it totally acceptable. And we were quite wealthy, but we used it rightly, you know, and it, it did set us apart. And then just birth and death were bookends of our life, you know, and we just, the synchronicity of it all we're seeing right now, some 30 years later, just now being accepted. And this whole communal cult issue that people are, are bringing up, I think it's basically being um, over, overused, overrated, misused, but it's like coming back uh, um, everywhere you're seeing, cult this, cult that, and being used almost in a very hip way now, you know, whereas before it didn't um, have a really good connotation to it, you when, know? When you hear the word uh, cult, what do you think, what do you think people think? What do you think is the connotation behind that word? A cult is what? When someone asks me, talks to me about a cult, I make them define it because I want to know what they're talking about. They say, were you guys a cult? What do you mean, cult? Because, you know, when ISIS just said it used to not have a very good m connotation and it's now beginning to change, in actual fact, many years ago it had a very clear definition and those definitions have been changed and those definitions now depend on where the person's coming from. I've done a good bit of study on this and basically when you talk about the word cult, um, each person means something different, their own uh, personal connotation for it, their filters, their interpretations. Basically cult is usually um, defines a religious group that has a certain basis tenant, you know, set of tenets. Um, in more recent history, it's taken on the connotative definition that that is quite negative. Um, it actually, uh, you know, has taken on connotations that would imply very negative things. And particularly in the last 30 and 40 years, when we've had you know, people aren't aware, most people are not aware of your, your viewership, would not be aware that um, during the 60s there were somewhere between 10 and 20,000 cults in America. Uh, when you say cults, these would be uh, groups, cults, uh, farms, you know, communal farms, communes, everybody remembers the communes, and uh, it goes on and on. You could take it uh, all the way up to uh, some corporations and you know different groups and uh, I could go on and on about cults but when you start getting into the connotative definitions the negative definitions you're often what's happening is you're getting into people's people's own interpretations and it depends on whether they're familiar with uh, Jim Jones or you know which one Manson. of the yeah the Manson people we were confused with them quite often uh, at times but you know who, what are those people's interpretations when, I, when someone asks me about a cult, as I say, I make them define it because I want to know where they're coming from. To, m to me, a cult is um, really, it's a part of culture. culture. That's really, to me, a definition. It's a subset of culture, uh, one, of, one of the subsets. And it, it is one of the most positive words to me. I mean, it's like a culture dish for the occult, you know, you can, <laughs> you can play with it forever, but basically, um, again, when you say, what do I think people, I don't think what people think about it, I make them tell me what they think about it when they, when they ask me a question about it, because I need to know where they're coming from before I'll even discuss it. Were we a cult? Sure, most people would think of, uh, think of us as a cult, but what do you think a cult is before I'll answer that question? I think the Boy Scouts were a cult. I oh, think absolutely. the Masons were a cult. I think Mary Kay was a cult with her little pink cars. You know, to me, cult doesn't have a bad meaning, but I do know that it does to other people. You know, we, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for cults. I mean, yeah. Jesus Christ and his disciples. How more cultish can you cult get for you that? Could ever, <laughs> you know? 
you know, it's, I, you know, the founding fathers <laughs> of our nation, they were like a little cult. It's, you know, you, you're, you begin to play with things. You begin to look at it and you think, if you really want to know, if you really look at it objectively, not speaking to you, but everyone in your viewership, if they think about it, their friends are in cults, their neighbors are in cults, their family members are in cults, and they're usually in cults. And don't think about it that way. If you really want to look at it, uh, America's a cult. I mean, we, we came here to get away from, from religious persecution, and now we've become this melting pot of misfits who are trying to figure out where do we fit, right? And that's why it's so confusing in America because there's so many different people who are trying to meld together and form this more or less a kind of a broad definition of a cult. If you want to talk about a cult, talk about the Catholic Church. It only has credibility because it's been around for thousands of years. And I don't think this word means the same in Europe or other parts. It could, but I don't think it does. I think it's basically here in America. What well, do you think it is uh, an American culture that makes people fearful of the, the reception of cult, which has a negative connotation? What do you think it is that people, when people hear cult, oftentimes there's this sort of recoil? Well, what do you think that recoil is about? The 70s, the 60s yeah. and 70s. It's about I the mean, 20 cults that gave everybody a bad and name. And not only that, that whole time frame changed the face of history, cha changed America. You know, that was radical for um, people. You come, 50 housewives, the families in the 50s and the, and the 60s were so straight. <laughs> you know, they had, uh, without the Bible, that was it spiritually. Uh, when a change takes place and you don't go with that change and you can't understand it, you know, they were into alcohol and prescription drugs. I mean, the kids of the 60s and 70s were running away from home as young as 12, hitchhiking as fast as they could to get to L.A. and San Francisco just to, you know, be deprogrammed from the brainwashing of their own family unit, which was a cult to begin with, if, I mean, if you really want to get into it. I ran as fast as I could for my family, you know, and wanted to be reprogrammed into something that was more in tune to the evolution of what my soul was feeling, and that was a spiritual uh, evolution that was breaking wide open, and it involved the flower children, the hippie movement, which went on to be the yippies and whatever we're into now. But it just uh, busted the dam wide open, that whole time frame, which unfortunately was a lot of drugs, a lot of sex. And so, you know, it's all a learning curve anyhow, isn't it? You know, what if, should have, could have, but, you know, it happened the way it happened. And then, of course, the Manson family, oh, my God, that just put the nail in the coffin for, for a lot of it. But... Um, so yeah, and Jonestown, mm -hmm. you know, but even in, within Jonestown, I know people that were in Jonestown. Um, there was some good intentions there. There was some Absolutely. good people there. Absolutely. You know, and it started out good. I knew his physician. I knew Jim yeah. Jones' physician, and he said that he was an amazing man. And yeah. those people were amazing people. But you know, when you ask what makes them afraid, it's the fear of the unknown. It's the fear of the unknown. And when, particularly when 20 cults have a bad name, and those are the only ones you hear about in the news. And we know that there were many, many thousands who weren't newsworthy because they were doing good things. So how do you balance that out? You try to, you try to you know, spread that word, and, and the news doesn't care about the good stuff that's going on. They're only looking for the, not you, but the, the news media are looking for the dramatic, which yeah. by nature. Well, we were beautiful. We were young. We were wealthy. We had no secrets. We were on Sunset Boulevard. We were open. People knew us. They came to us, all the mover and shakers. We couldn't have been more in the public eye. We had you know, nothing to hide. People knew where we lived. People came to our homes. You know, so it's, uh, I don't know if we, we could be put in that same category. We weren't in the backwoods with a fence and guns guarding us at first, you know. Um, Hawaii is a different story, but that was for safety. That wasn't because of us. But in the beginning, we were just completely open. You know, we, our children, there was no corporal punishment. Um, 
brainwashing, I mean, I don't know how do you define brainwash. I mean, any of us were allowed to leave at any time and in fact encouraged to if we weren't with the program of the whole. You had 150 people living in one house. You either had to be with that program or not there, you know, so. What, what, what need, what need do you think it fulfills in a person to be a part of a community, whether you want to call it a cult or right. a, a, a family group, or what, what, is, what is the need that being a part of that sort of a group answers? Well, we all have empty places within us, and that's why religion develops. That's why, you know, we have so many different groups that we become why we have family it's to fulfill those needs and so that when someone is seeking someone is when someone is seeking something different and looking for something different they have to find that which fulfills their soul and that open place within them um, you know if like for example when when we found our father our spiritual father he basically had grown to a place where when I found him he spoke nothing but God. When he opened his mouth, you were sitting in front of Moses. You heard words come from him that struck a chord in your soul that was so deep that I'm struggling to hold back the tears now. Just amazing, and this is 35 years later, just amazing power where he would reach down inside of your soul and touch you. And most of the groups have someone who is a charismatic leader who has a very powerful method of presentation but it's more than that there's so much more than that and so many of them take advantage of the power that they gain and that's what gives the groups a, a bad name but like for example in our situation which we really had 500 people to go through have names and numbers of those there are about a hundred who were the real core who stuck with him 140 stuck with him to the end and what they found was something that fulfilled that emptiness in their soul. And so when Icy said we were together, if you didn't get with the program, it was a vibration. There was a vibration in the house, in the room, in the business. We hung out with a very famous man yesterday who kept saying, when you went in that restaurant, you knew there was something different going on. You knew that these were just waiters and waitresses, but they weren't just waiters and waitresses. They were so much more. There was so much more going on there. And it was that vibration. When you could fit into that vibration, and Father was the super glue that created that vibration. He set the tone. He set the vibration. When we all fitted into it, the magic was palpable. It was amazing. And I know for me, what, what, I, what I got out of it, and I would think other people would by doing something like this, was... It was a program that your soul was attuned to, you know. I never vibrated to the yogis of the ashrams. I tried, but it just it wasn't my program. Mm -hmm. And when I went into the source and found Father, it was like I knew immediately that that was my, my program. Instantaneous. And so it fulfilled whatever evolution I'm on in my path now. That was my ray. You know, it didn't just come from this life. I don't think anything, just myself personally, feel like it, what people are seeking to fulfill or what groups they go to or what they're looking for uh, is just a random, random act. I think it's all part of a thread that we bring with us. And, um, you know, what, what really excited me was it was never stagnant. You know, every day we learn something, every day. Uh, was laughter and humor, and every day a little bit more was revealed that was like astonishing in the spiritual realms of understanding. So everybody just, um, you know, depends on, on, on what you're looking for, what you're going to get. Some people find drinking buddies, and that's great, you know, or, or meet at the bar on the corner. You know, you have people that go to the same bar, the same place, the same 50 people, whether they know each other or not, and they all drink together. It's like a com camaraderie, camaraderie that fulfills a need. I mean, who, how can you psychoanalyze any of it, really? But You know, I you feel know. like it breaks down to faith to some degree. Everybody has faith in something. And if you don't have faith, you're pretty much over. You're pretty much dead if you don't have faith in, in anything. Uh, but if you look at life people choose what they're going to put their faith in. And as Icy says, some put their faith in a certain bar in town where they go, and every night they're there with their buddies and they're drinking. 
Some people put their faith in motorcycles. Some people put their faith in race cars. Some people put their faith in, in you know, some uh, preacher or spiritual uh, course. But basically, what you choose to put your faith in, if it lets you down, then that lets you down as a person and you begin to deteriorate. If you can find something that fulfills that empty spot that I talked about, that basically is the faith that enables you to, to you know, go higher and to find a higher purpose in life, which is basically what we were seeking was a higher purpose in life. What do you, talk to me a little bit about what it was like to live in an environment where What it was like to live in an environment where you're actually living amongst the person who you see as your spiritual leader. How profound is it? I think everybody would like that, but few people find that. How profound is that to live day in and day out? Actually, that, um, Overwhelming. that set us apart also because most gurus, masters, had their own inner sanctum and nobody else got to be part of it or live in it except, you know, maybe on a Sunday like or, or morning meditation. So. Um, it was awesome, you know. Not only did we get to live with, with, with the spiritual leader and be part of who he was, but each other. You know, there was 150, I would say 150 people who got to know each other. It was a real sisterhood and brotherhood, which led into us being able to work together. I mean, there was no secrets, there couldn't be. You're in a three-bedroom house, you knew everything about each other. And um, that's why it worked so well for him to have 14 women, because we were sisters before. We knew each other. It wasn't like somebody cold came in off the street. We all had the same standards and expectations and, you know, basically goodwill towards each other. I'm not saying that there weren't times we didn't have, you know, other stuff that needed to be worked through or happening. It wasn't perfect. But basically, it was pretty awesome. You know, he was totally an open book. He <laughs> shared with us his whole life. We, we were weaned on stories of everything he experienced from the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, as if, you, you know, you were sitting there talking to your grandfather or your own father about their war experience, about things that were just un unbelievably funny or tragic or... You know, we got we got the whole thing, got the whole thing, and there was no hiding anything. You know, one you thing, got what you saw. There, there wasn't anything fake about it. One thing I want to I want to say, but I want to preface it just a little bit to make sure that everyone knows that I'm not judging anyone else. But um, everyone has a guru or a master or a preacher or what, not everyone but many people do or they're atheists or agnostics they have their own belief system which is quite often stronger than someone who has a, a preacher or whatever but um, one thing that father would often say is it's very easy to tell the difference between a guru and a master or a father because a father is your father and that's he was there as Icy said living in the house with us every day the gurus and the masters usually set up a reward system. There's karma or there's some cause and effect that you know, you're going to either win something or lose something somewhere in the universe by, based on, your, on what you do. Father said that basically heaven is here and now. It's not a place that you die and go to. It's something that you build here and now based on how much you can visualize that in the moment. And that's that's what set him apart for us, as I say, not to judge anyone else's trip. I love the fact that other people, it kind of keeps them out of trouble, right? Gives them <laughs> something to believe in and something to do. Um, I love, you know, I've been involved in Buddhism and all sorts of studies. We were very eclectic. But that was what set him apart for us, for what we needed for that empty spot in our soul. That's great. Yeah. We're going to end you guys there. Sure. Are you talking to me? You. Oh, <laughs> I didn't realize I had a red background. <laughs> I'm like. <clears throat> More. 
Um, that's a really good question. That's a really good question. Um, I think everybody has his own individual need and desire that he's searching for. Uh, there's kind of an overall general need that seems to surface in all humanity. I mean, you can go back and talk about the, uh, you know, water, food, sex, and curiosity. But the first three are fairly cut and dried. When you get to the curiosity, that's sort of the need that <clears throat> really arises when you begin to look for spiritual growth. When, you know, I think everyone has a need to be fulfilled um, spiritually. I know that everybody wouldn't agree with that. I know some people would say, oh, no, I have no interest in spirit whatsoever. Um, I'd much rather watch football on Sunday mornings. Well, there's a certain amount of spiritual fulfillment in everything, including watching football <laughs> on Sunday morning. I love it, too. I really get into the spirit of the moment, and, and there's uh, a lot to be said of, uh, you know, even drinking. I'm not a, much of a drinker, but... When I do, we definitely get into the spirit of the moment while sharing the spirits of the alcohol. So, um, you know, what do people need? Um, I would say that that would be one of the answers, would be spiritual fulfillment, whether they know it or not, and however they find that, and everyone finds it different. And that is part of the rub. That's part of the problem with society, that everybody tends to begin to judge other people's uh, method of obtaining spirituality even within our family who were so close there are people who go well you're doing this and why are you doing that and I say well I'm doing that because father said this and they go yeah but he said that well one of the things father said is all truth is but a half truth and you can go that circle for the rest of your life but the purpose was to let us know that the nature of the universe has changed be ready for change whatever so so what do people need they need you know the basics and then they need something beyond that a lot of people find that in art and aesthetics that's their spiritual growth I find that my sons and I find it in that a lot but all of it in some way or another can be interpreted as a spiritual fulfillment once again and I've never talked about this for some reason it keeps coming up that empty place in the soul that you can't fill up with food a lot of people try you can't fill it up with alcohol, although a lot of people try. It, it, I'm not sure it can be filled up in any way because we see all of these people who seem so completely fulfilled and then they're in the news for, you know, something, sex in a bathroom or, or you know, childhood, child abuse or something. So it's really, I, I think that curiosity drive is an infinite drive. And I think it will continue to drive people until they leave their body and right up until, you know, to leave the body in some cases. But that curiosity drive is part of what motivated Jim Baker, father, part of what motivated me to find him, part of what motivates everyone. And it is that curiosity, that seeking for a spiritual fulfillment, which I don't know if it's ever fulfilled. I don't know if otherwise I think it's kind of over. Um, Basically, when you know when your curiosity is gone, what are you what are you doing? What are you what are you looking for? And and what do you think for people who are attracted to what some of them might call a cult or what some of them might call an alternate lifestyle, something outside of the, the norm? Mm -hmm. What do you think is attracted to people about an, an, an unordinary kind of a life or an unordinary kind of a religion? Well, every, you know, there are a lot of different kinds of people. Um, some people spend their lives in fear of the unique, in fear of anything out of the ordinary. Um, many times they've had a reason for that. They've been burned or scared in some way by something that was unique and out of the ordinary. There are those people who kind of stand in the middle and they like the out of the ordinary, but they're afraid of it at the same time. And those people oftentimes will jump to one side or the other, go back and forth. Um, that happens in cults and in families and in communes all the time, that someone will be attracted to a cult 
and then they'll certainly burn out on it and they'll get out of it. And their reactions can be any, everywhere from staying positive to it to becoming, there's a professional a, uh, term among people, scientists who study cults called the professional enemy. And you've heard from them. Everybody hears from them. The guy who gets on television and posits himself as a, uh, a uh, expert on cults and everything he says is negative. Well, why? Because he's processing all of the fears and doubts that he had when he went in, kept while he was there, thought he had dealt with them, suddenly couldn't handle anymore and jumped out and now he's gone to the other side and he's, he's suddenly that expert. Um, but the, the ones who really become that different lifestyle, they are that person who loves the unique, loves the out of the ordinary, needs that. That is part of what fulfills his soul. And those people are, are really among our leaders, always among our leaders, among the, the masters, among the great poets, the great musicians, the ones who are always searching for the horizon, looking beyond. That was Jim Baker. Um, his destiny was to seek it until he found it. And as far as I'm concerned, he's the only person that I know of possibly besides Buddha and Jesus Christ who reached God consciousness that I know of in my realm of experience. And that was because he was just determined. He was going to find it, whatever it took. And he kept seeking that unique, that out of the ordinary until he found it. And he found it in such an enlightened and such a phenomenal way that we all were able to find it through him. Does that answer the question? <laughs> And there are always people, though, who would, who would doubt other people's path. And I think that when you were in the group, there must have been people who were doubters, who would, who would try to sort of uh, bring their negativity. And how, do you, how, do you, how did you deal with that, the people who were scared, the people who were cynical? Uh, how did you address that, or how did you deal with that within yourself within the group? They left. Most, most of the time, they just left. Jesus was talking about... The we had a vibration and fit into the vibe. Um, there were definitely people who were more into the vibe than others. I'm not saying higher or lower. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with something. But in general, if you were there, Imagine 140 people in a room exercise really hard. Take a cold shower, take a dip in the cold pool, take a cold shower, get come in, sit in the lotus position in a room that there was no room everybody's there was no room and um, we had sacred ceremonies that we would do together and then we would chant the sacred name of God in some way or another and listen to fathers channeling God in one way or another for two three hours the vibration in that room became the vibration of one if you weren't into that vibration Everybody could see it. You could literally see the vibration in the room. It functioned as one unit. And if somebody was off, you knew it. If somebody's fidgeting or, you know, I mean, we were just zoom gone. And anybody who wasn't there, you knew it right away. Now, we had people who came in new who some would last five minutes, some would last two hours, some would last two days. But everybody knew pretty much right from the start. We had a lady who came in one time, and one of the things we would always say, everybody, not father, father would say it too, but we would always, always say, be still and know that I am God. That is not to say that I am the only God. That is to say that I have now recognized that I am a part of the universal God, which 
anybody who believes in God knows God has to be everywhere. So if, he can, if he's everywhere, how could he not be in me? We recognize that. So we would always say, be still and know that I am God. We had this woman who came in and she was making all this noise and somebody said, be still and know that I am God. Well, she loved that. She started going around and saying it to everybody in the room. She'd get in front of us and go, be still and know I am God. Well, Father was upstairs in his room and he was coming down for the meditation and he knew that this was going on. So she went up and sat in his chair and she was saying, she kept saying it over and over. So he snuck down and slipped down into his chair behind her and he was sitting behind her and she suddenly noticed it and she turned around and said, be still and know that I am God right into his face. And Father just smiled and looked at one of the sons and said, and she was gone just like that, taken to the source and and never to come back. Because if she couldn't get into the vibe, it wasn't a matter of egos and individuals, it was a matter of joining the vibration. So hope that that answers. <laughs> That is a, such a difficult question. That's the kind of thing that uh, I think time is probably the major element that would be in consideration there. Um, as I mentioned a while ago, I knew the physician who served Jim Jones's family. And he knew that I was in the Source family later on during our relationship. This is 20 years ago, uh, 12, 14 years after I left the family, the Source family. And uh, not long after Jim Jones, um, you know, pulled his thing, uh, he, almost, he sat with tears in his eyes and told me what a great man he was and how wonderful his people were and, his, and that he would never have guessed, not in a million years, that anything like that would have happened. Um, and I know that the people who were with him never would have guessed it, even though I know he talked about things like that. But Father talked about ra ra radical things, too, uh, often just to run our heads through those things so that we could adjust to them because the nature of the universe has changed. We have to be able to handle whatever comes. Um, that's, uh, that's a question that will never be answered. Uh, the only thing I can say is to look at it and know that during the 60s and 70s, I know of no less than 15,000 cults, at least 10,000 cults and, and communes and families. And there are 10 that many people could name and 20 that if you go and search the news, they're going to be, have radical history. Well, that's almost the exact same percentage that if you look at this city or any other city, there's a percentage of people who do bad things and they're in the news or they're in jail almost the same percentage. So part of the reason we are here is to address this subject and to ask people to try to put away fears, try to put away doubts, try to put away the, the utter fear of, of something unique, something unusual, because, you know, as a country, we're founded on religious freedom. That's that's the basis of this whole thing that we're trying to do here. So if we're going to do it, we need to do it. And the only way we can do that is to develop a certain amount of faith. Is that going to hurt us? Once in a while. Once in a while, somebody's going to pull a mass shooting on the streets. Is that guy a cult? No. Once in a while, a cult's going to go bad. Is there anything we can do about it? I doubt it. But what went wrong? Uh, some people are flawed. There's a small percentage of us that are flawed. And, you know, we can't cut out everything and stop everything just because, I mean, you're going to go get in your car when we leave, right, and drive home. Well, how many people are killed today in an automobile accident? Much higher percentage than are killed in a cult today. So it's a matter of you just have to have a little bit of faith and look very carefully. And that was the beauty of what Father would say. Father would say, look at me. If there's anything that you find that does not make you comfortable, that does not make you happy, that does not make you feel faith in me, go. And if you find anything better, anywhere, I demand 
that you tell me about it. Because I'm not saying I'm it. I'm saying I'm looking for it. Meanwhile, I'll play the role. I'll play the role until we find something better. So how do you find the evil? How's your neighbor doing? How do you find the evil in the neighbors around you? There's no way to answer that question. You just got to keep your eye. Father would say, live in the now. Learn from the past. Keep your eye peeled on the future. And that's the way we did it. And that's why we could see that he was there and, and strong for us. And anybody who messes with a family, a commune, or a cult, just keep your eye peeled and watch for any hints. And if they, the leader starts talking about weird off stuff and all this mass sex, all this mass sex and all of this stuff, you're out of there. Keep your head about you, that's all. If you want to do something else again, let me know. Okay, you ready? But I'm interested in knowing what the transition was like when you, to try to transition back into society after being a part of something so profound. Oh shit! We got a couple of weeks. <laughs> um, you know, this is this is such a deep question. You know, uh, what was the transition when you left high school? What was the transition when you left your family? Um, any transition in life brings excitement, joy, suspense, and usually psychological issues. And I say issues very advisedly. They can be good issues or bad issues. They can be problems. Um, when we landed back on the earth from what we had felt was heaven, um, it was like, what happened? The world seemed like a completely different world to us because we had left the world for a period of time. And when we came back, it was a completely different world, just like it is today, such a different world. Um, we had to figure out how to unite ourselves into that world. and. We had issues that we had to deal with that we were not aware of. Um, psychological issues. Our father had left us. He actually left his physical body. Uh, the family became dysfunctional because we didn't have our spiritual glue anymore. So we were back in reality. And we didn't have any money. We didn't have any clothes. We didn't, we didn't have anything. Did you say we didn't have any money again? Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, God. We had a lot of noise. <laughs> <laughs> that was such, I mean, that's poignant. And if you don't mind just saying that part again, yeah. I'd appreciate it. We were back on the earth. We basically had nothing. Um, we were a group of people living together who were struggling to keep it together financially. So when we found ourselves back on the earth, we didn't have any money. We didn't have any clothes. We didn't have any skills virtually. Some of us did, but some came in really young. They had never developed the skills to work. And Father had told us that you, many of you will go back to where you started, back to your homes, back to your families, back to where you were vibrationally or spiritually. And we watched it happen. Some didn't. Some took that as a challenge. I took it as a challenge. I'm moving forward. I'm going up from here. But, you know, it's like suddenly you're back on. We were, imagine going to Mars. Stay there a million years. Come back here. Earth's time hasn't changed. It's only been five years on the Earth. You've moved a million years ahead, and you come back. And that's the way we felt. 
we had seen, and I don't want to, anyone to take this wrong, I know people can grab sound bites out of what I say, but we had seen ourselves as God's family. We were united in God. We held the vibration of God. Everything outside of our family was the Maya. It was the physical. So suddenly we're back in the Maya, and it was a shock. Uh, we've had people to be killed. We had people to go into drug use, prostitution, major illness. We've lost 15 members so far, and we were only about 150. This is only 35 years later. So we, we saw everything happen, and we experienced everything ourselves. But that kind of goes back to the thing I was talking about, the psychological issues when you're suddenly back in reality. To some degree, we needed to grieve. We needed to heal. And nobody knew that. Father had taught us the keys of transmutation. Let it pass through you without affecting you and grow from the situation. It'll either kill you or make you stronger. We came back into the world and it wasn't making some of us stronger, but we didn't know how to deal with that. Everybody had their own way of dealing with it. So, you know, when you look at that question and you go, okay, what happened? What are you going to do with it? Basically, Father said, create your own reality. You can do whatever you want to do as long as you're kind. And everybody fitted back into the world and tried to make it work with their own frame of reference. And we've had some huge success stories and some huge failures, some flaming failures. So the experience was different for each individual, but I happened to, since I wrote the book, I see I wrote our book, the source book, and uh, since we've done a lot of research on this, I happen to know a lot of the stories, and it's a phenomenally difficult question to answer, but uh, fascinating, and, and un uh, the answers are coming to us daily and will be until everybody's gone, basically. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Oh, gosh. Thank you. Thank you. A lot of people starting to look around us. I don't know if someone wants to speak to them. Is where's Jason? He's right here. Where's our bulldog? Maybe you could just say, just ask me to say 10 minutes of quiet. Get on to remember the topic. Okay. So I'm just going to do a few questions. And the first, like the first two, I'll do in that general, sort of a general macro statement. Why do people, what are people? And then I'm going to ask you a specific question, um, like two specific questions about uh, about your life inside the source. And then we'll sure. be done. Okay. Are you ready? Sorry, three seconds. Okay. There's always something. I know, huh? It's not A, it's B. It's not C, it's D. Got it. Okay. Ready? Go. What are people searching for? You know, I am just now learning not to speak for anybody else but myself. So, wow. <laughs> you know, it's like it was a really hard lesson for me to learn to do that because I was always you know, speaking as if I knew what everybody else was thinking, what they needed and wanted. And I just finally honed myself to only speak for myself. So I don't even know if I can answer that. What are you searching for? You know, I can tell you what I'm searching for. Um, I am searching to leave this life better than when I can ever remember coming into it right from the beginning. I'm searching for a feeling of being okay with being okay with myself, of being able to leave this life knowing that um, I passed this grade to a certain degree, but if, you know, passing grades a D minus, so I feel like I'm, I'm going to be okay with that. And um, I'm not really looking to. I'm not really looking to do anything or for anything. I'm just taking things as they come. Uh, when I met Jim Baker before he even started the source, it was a very brief period, and I did not connect with him. It was my, not my time with him. But when I met him when he was father in the family, that was, uh, I, I feel like, for lack of a better word, you know, I shot my lot on that time, time frame. It was like everything I was looking for, everything I wanted, everything that fulfilled me, I got when he was physically here by reconnecting with him again. I immediately knew that that was my destiny 
and my destiny was to, was to preserve his legacy, that legacy of who he was and the family. And by doing the book that I just did, um, I feel like I've done that. So anything else now is just um, icing on the cake and great, and I'm just flowing with it. And I really don't feel a, a great need to think I'm searching for anything or anything's unfulfilled. I feel, I feel like I've been given all the keys and all the wisdom, and I might not be living all of them, but I know them, and just the fact that I know them stops the search. Uh, for me, and um, you know, there's just, uh, my daughter just had a baby, so there's just all kinds of things that are very fulfilling to me right now. So, I don't know if I'm searching for anything, and I don't know what anybody else is searching for, you know, but I hope they find it, and I, and I think they will. I think everybody's being given the opportunity now to be able to find that with no more secrets. You know, everything is out there, everybody's got the opportunity. You know, define what they're searching for, for gosh sakes. Tell me what, um, we didn't get a chance to talk about it. What, were the rela what was your relationship with the father like in terms of a romantic relationship, a, a, a man-woman relationship? Um, when I came into the family, it was an instant working relationship for many lifetimes. You know, he immediately told me that I was always the high priestess in the temple with him, that type of a thing. And uh, he named me the archive keeper, the historian, the temple keeper. And it started that way. And it's just, I was always in his circumvent force. Um, right from the beginning, I was always allowed to, you know, go be with him, be in this room, and just, you know, to be with him which evolved into being one of his 14 women. And it was just a very natural thing to, to be there and be very comfortable with him. And um, I was a little older uh, than some of the girls. You know, some of the women that came in were, were, were younger, you know, the late teens, or early 20s. I was 28 or 29, so I was, I was not intimidated. I felt more comfortable uh, with life experience and with him, and I had known him before as Jim Baker. So it was just a very comfortable, natural relationship. There was a, a working relationship, a business relationship. Um, you know, they called me his bulldog, the hatchet lady, the dragon lady. You know, every group has one to make sure everything's running and taken care of. And yet there was those times where I was his woman, and we did have a romantic relationship. And the thing, the thing about him was it worked because it was always a one-on-one -on -one energy. Everyone always got their time. It wasn't a group thing, you know. So my romantic relationship with him was very deep. It was through many lifetimes. And I was just thrilled to reconnect with him again this lifetime. And the thing is, I quite frankly haven't found... Um, people ask me, why am I still hanging on to that? I don't see any reason not to. I mean, it was so great. Why would I give it up? Why would I not still, you know, I, I'm not stupid. I, it's not like I'm in a fog and I haven't gone out and functioned in the world. You know, I have. I've been very responsible. But I, I see no part in giving any of that up. But I've carried it with me. And, and he's still a very much part of my life and my being and my romantic uh, circle. I don't feel like he's left me. And, um, and did you feel like you were able to overcome what a lot of people think of as jealousy towards other women or possession, I like a possessiveness? I never, well, okay. I can speak for myself. Sure. There was that with other women, just because of different age, ages, different karmic things that they have with each other. I did not, I can truly say I did not have uh, jealousy or, um, what was the other word? Possessiveness? Possessiveness, mm -hmm. no. I did not have, them, have that with him myself. I did not have to deal with that. Um, I was very fulfilled, and I was, you know, doing other work for him. I didn't, I didn't feel like I needed him all to myself, you know. And there was no jealousy, because, well, first of all, you know, these were, we were a sisterhood. These were sisters of mine. We all lived in the same, you know, we were all there together, and we had fun together. We really did love each other, you know. And uh, me personally, I just didn't have that. Uh, 
karmic relationship with that situation. It just worked for you. Then. It, it worked for me, yeah. It did. And then you talked a little bit about um, how sort of like you think of it as shooting your wad, like, that it was the best I time mean, of your life. It was. It was a hard act to follow, I'm going to tell you. That was a, that was a uh, and you'll ask any of his women, any of his wives, or any neighbor to rob and light on up. You know, he is still the love of their life to this day, and he is still like their husband. You know, no, they, no matter who they've been with, what they've tried, it's all gone back to him for the women in his life. He was, he was a man's man, but he was also a woman's man. He was a very unique man. And how was that transition then back into the quote-unquote real world for you? Um, I, well, when we left, um, I was with one of the, the sons of the family, one of the men, and we did have a baby, so I did have that. And um, none of us really particularly liked going back out in the world because we were wearing robes, we were wearing nightgowns, we were, how do you go out into the world looking like that and think you're going to get a job? I remember going to... I don't even know what it was, a clothing store, and looking at the clothes and going, I don't know what to buy, I don't know how to dress. What do I wear? Who am I now? How do you walk the streets? And you can't walk the streets wearing nightgowns like you were wearing or velvet robes you know, with our breasts practically hanging out. It, it's just, it was, it was a shock. It was a shock. It was, um, it was a, it was different. It was something that you know, we had not bargained for and we were not ready for. And did you feel judged? Did you feel misunderstood? Um, when we left? When you came back into kind of straight society. I, I don't remember feeling that because I think I was just too consumed. I had a baby. I think I was just too consumed trying to figure it out and get it together. And a lot of us did, a lot of us went home, you know, and had to work out that judgment with our family. So I guess there was some judgment and misunderstandings in a way. How did your family accept you or reintegrate? Uh, my family with uh, open arms, you know, but I, I never lost my love for my family. You know, but it was a very supportive family. To my family. And you know, this was still the time of the 70s. There were still people in ashrams and the gurus, and, and that was still happening. There were still people living around in the woods. So it wasn't like we were all of a sudden aliens running around and, and being really different. Where we were different was when we had to leave LA or San Francisco. People that went back to the Midwest or went anywhere but here, then yeah, it got very strange. For, for a very short amount of time, that we got on the way. And in retrospect, do you have any doubts that that was the, the right path, the path that you chose to go to the source and be a part of that thing? Oh, no. no. For me, there's no, absolutely no doubt. None at all. Can you say that one more time? I like that. Just for me, there was absolutely no doubt that there that was the right path. Absolutely no doubt for myself that that was right for me. In fact, up until that time, I, I just knew I didn't fit in anywhere. I knew I was searching, 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 and I had not found what I found. And as soon as I walked into it, that was all gone, and I had found it. You know? So there was never any doubt there still is. So things could have some, you know, things could have been hindsight. You know, we could have done some things different. There's a what if, should have, could have. But that's the same with anything, isn't it? You know, and it's a learning curve. So, um, but other than that, no, there's, there's no doubt in my mind at all. And I am just so thankful that I, I had that this life. And um, I don't have a fear of death because of it. Um, I have the wisdom. I'm able to go into any situation, and, and I know I can handle it. You know, I, I, I don't have a whole lot of doubts, you know. I'm still working on personal issues that have been there all my life, which have nothing to do with the family. You know, we all have crap. We all need our corners around and off. But, you know, not, not, no doubts at all. Any, uh, any last thoughts you want to leave us with? Anything at all that you feel like you'd like to have heard or that you'd like to say? Last thoughts. Um, no, I just, um, 
in the 70s, there, everybody felt like something was happening, that there was an opening, something was going on. And I feel, um, actually my last thoughts is, this is happening again, and a lot of people are feeling the same thing, especially the younger people are coming up to me because of the birthday going, you know, I just, I relate to this because I feel something's happening now. It's kind of like the 70s where you guys knew something was happening and you were going, what's going on? And it was like a crossover, and it's happening again. So I think my last thoughts would be, it's happening again. You know, let's, let's all pay attention to it so that uh, nobody misses out on whatever you're not supposed to be missing out on now. But, you know, like a lot of people do Oh, that's like a good time to end it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>